Great. So I think we're good to jump right in then. I appreciate everybody taking the time to join today's webinar. Uh, my name is Anders. I'm one of our senior account executives here at Start Engine. Um, so I run a team here and my primary job is to speak all day, every day with founders, you know, that are look out there looking to raise some capital and really introduce an alternative means to the more traditional routes of raising that you might be familiar with venture capital, private equity, reg D some private rounds. Um, so the goal today is really just to provide a high level overview. And of course, some disclosures that hopefully you guys can see on the screen. Can I just get a quick thumbs up, Gary, that you've got the the presentation up and you can see it. Perfect. Um, so my goal today is just to be a helpful resource for you guys, provide some high level information about the industry that we live in, um, provide some helpful examples and just set the framework for, you know, regulation crowdfunding. Um, and then we've also brought in Grady here, who's a farm to me alumni, and he's actually gone through the process on Start Engine has raised over a million dollars. So you know, in all likelihood, the, the most value you'll find out of this conversation is just an open dialogue amongst us two. And just hear, you know, from a founder that's gone through this and, you know, can answer any questions that you have. And I can, you know, I'm here to help and be a resource as well. So we'll open this up for some Q&A um, towards the end. I'm going to try and rip through some of these more informational slides as quickly as I can so that we can get to, you know, the meat of this, which is to, you know, be helpful for you guys and to answer any questions um, that you might have. So if we don't get to any of your questions, um, by all means, my email is just my first name, Anders, A-N-D-E-R-S at startengine.com. More than happy to take things offline. If you guys do, you know, if this presentation does spark your interest and you'd like to, you know, explore around, um, I'll be your guy and I'll work with you and my team to to, to explore something. So really wanted to start with just sort of a, a high level overview of what is crowdfunding. So uh, I'm sure a, a lot of you guys out there, you know, have heard of Indiegogo, Kickstarter, and rewards based crowdfunding and crowdfunding in general has been around for a long time. Um, so when you look at equity crowdfunding, it's slightly different than like a rewards based where you become a backer in a campaign. Typically, a Kickstarter Indiegogo model, you're really looking to purchase a new product or a new release and be one of the first to get it. Whereas as of 2016, with the Jobs Act, um, it became federally legal to issue securities online in exchange for an investment. So instead of a donation to become a backer in a campaign, you're putting real money into a company and, and you know receiving real ownership of that company moving forward. So that's really what we're going to focus on today. So the two regulations that we support at Start Engine are regulation crowdfunding, or what I'll call Reg CF, um, and regulation A, which is like the big brother. So the main difference is, is that with Reg CF, as a private company, you can raise up to $5 million every 12 months from a mix of both non-accredited and accredited investors alike. Um, so it might be a little bit too, too TMI, if you will, but going into the weeds a bit, um, there's an exemption from Section 12G of the Securities Act, which means that regardless of the amount of shareholders that you have on your cap table, you're not going to become subject to public reporting requirements. You don't need to register your securities. And investors that come in through Reg CF and Reg A are part of this exemption. Um, so what we're doing is we're opening up the, the gates, if you will, to have anybody invest in your company, whether that's friends, family, customers, existing investors, or the network of investors that we've spent years uh, accumulating ourselves, which is about a million investors today. Great. Well, we're probably going to focus a lot on the Reg CF stuff today. The Reg A is a different animal. You know, it takes about three to five months to get qualified by the SEC. You can raise much more. You can raise up to 75 million every year, but it's a substantial cost out of pocket. So typically what our issuers will do is they'll maximize or oversubscribe the first five million while getting set up for a larger Reg A um, in parallel. So the main advantage is really, depending on the, the stage of your business, I would say is the main difference. Obviously, the audience of investors is different. You're tapping into retail investors and non-accredited folks to join the cap table. But the main value that I you know, try to you know, communicate to entrepreneurs and to founders is that you can raise this capital on your own terms. So if you're an early stage company and you want to keep control and avoid, give, avoid giving out any board seats or preferred shares, this is a great vehicle for you or also later stage companies that are on the brink of losing control and have a lot of, you know, preferred shares outstanding. This might be a good model to just issue non-voting securities or securities that forfeit voting rights 
to maintain that control. So I'd say the terms is one of the biggest advantages of going this route. But also, if you think about a consumer product like Grady's Cold Brew, for example, when you're going out and raising a million dollars from a thousand investors, these thousand investors, and for lack of a better way to put it, are you know become super fans of the business and they become loyal brand ambassadors that are out there not just consuming your product, but also you know telling their friends, telling their family about your product. So typically, what we see. You know, depending on the industry, consumer products being a great example, when companies are out there raising capital for three months on our platform, they're typically seeing a spike in their bottom line as well. You know, the advertisements and marketing that we do to go out and acquire investors is in turn also acquiring consumers, acquiring new followers, more engagement on social. So equity crowdfunding funding can very much be seen as a brand building exercise outside of just the capital raise. Um, so a couple of things, you know, it sounds too good to be true. You know, there are some things to, you know, be aware of. One of them being that your financials will be made public as part of the offering statement that gets filed with the SEC. So a two-year review um, of balance sheet and PL done by a third-party CPA, where you know, Start Engine would essentially be introducing you to, will do that. Um, and there is for the Reg CF, there's one annual filing that's due 120 days after the end of your fiscal year. We just got through form CAR season being, you know, the start of May, end of April. Um, but outside of that, you know, it's the only filing that you need to make. There's no one-on-one -on -one investor communications that are required. It's definitely a best practice to keep in touch with your investors post round. Again, they're your ambassadors. You want to keep them happy and out there talking about the business. Um, whereas the reg egg, it's a little bit more, it's semi-annual, there's audited financials that are required. Um, but the biggest takeaway that I like to tell founders, if you are exploring a lot of options to funding the business, equity crowdfunding is a model that's very much get out what you put in. If you spend a uh, hundred hours going out, flying around the country, pitching VCs, getting term sheets, you know, you may come out with nothing at the end of it or terms that you don't like. If you put in a hundred hours marketing the equity crowdfunding opportunity and talking to retail investors, you know, you're going to see results and people are going to, you know, back the campaign and become investors in your company. So very much a get out what you put in. Um, and that's sort of the framework that we work at. So when you look at where investors actually come from to do a million dollar raise, for example, there's really three buckets. You know, there's the, the Grady's cold brew um, community. <clears throat> there's existing customers, existing investors, followers on social, there's always going to be an aspect of the issuer driving a raise amongst people that are most familiar and already fans of the business that would be eager for the opportunity to own, you know, real equity in the company. Then there's going to be the start engine or the platform community, which consists of, again, now it's seed invest investors plus start engine, or it's the, you know, investors that we go out and spend on marketing and advertising to acquire them to create investment accounts on our site. Um, and the, the difference really on a typical round between what you guys bring to the raise and what we bring to the raise is filled through the general public. And typically that's done by PR, Facebook ads, Google ads, podcast, radio, TV. You know, we find that TV works really well for certain companies, just getting the message out there. Here's who we are. If you want to be a part of what we're building, go to, you know, our campaign and invest now. So it's really just want to use this slide to think that it's a it's a collaborative effort amongst the issuer, start engine, and you know the general public. So you know we've got a saying here: always be raising, um, which is you know as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's easier to raise capital when you don't need it. Um, when you when you're well when you're a well capitalized business and you start to see you know a down economy or inflation or supply chain issues, it's always better to have cash. So we have, you know, the saying that you should always be raising and these regulations play really well into that. So, you know, $5 million is a new limit, by the way, this increase from a million back in 2021. Um, but it's a lot of capital that gives you a lot of runway and flexibility to, you know, build up the balance sheet and remain well capitalized for whatever is to come. So typically what companies do is, you know, they work with me and my team to learn about the industry, you know, doing stuff like this webinar. They'll sign engagement docs to work with us. We'll go out and raise, you know, a million, two million, three million, whatever it might be, but ultimately helping support them through future financing via Reg A. So I think over 50% of the companies that we raise with typically do come back for a second round at some point. 
they might do a couple reg CFs before going into the reg A, or they might do a full 5 million reg CF into a larger reg A. But we have companies that basically, you know, bounce back and forth, depending on where they're at for that annual cap, might do a CF, an A, a small CF after that. But this idea of always, you know, ingesting capital into the business is one that we do ourselves. You know, we've got to raise live, we raise around, give or take a million dollars a month just to help us offset our own costs. Um, but giving us the flexibility and the balance sheet to make acquisitions like Seed Invest when we see fit and when we, you know, can see advantages or, you know, opportunities in the market. Um, the last piece of this is just, you know, Start Engine has a secondary market. Um, so issuers that go out and raise with us have the option to provide liquidity to their community and pro provide liquidity to their investors prior to any acquisition or an IPO. Um, this, the shares that are sold through Reg CF are sold with a 12 month lockup period. Um, so you're not eligible to transfer ownership outside of, you know, an existing family member, or accredited investor, or some other sort of exceptions. But once these shares are freely tradable, you know, they're meant to be traded and meant to be sold. And there's just no real marketplace for these securities today, um, which is a big push on our end to introduce that market. So um, that's a, I won't go too much into detail on that. It's a very important piece of our own business model um, that we're slowly rolling out. And you'll see a lot more of this year. Anders, quick question. We got a question here from Steve. Um, sure. I'm not sure we're going to get into it later, but um, may as well throw it out there now. Um, it doesn't look like it's on this page either. Of the three investor groups that you mentioned in the last page, your kind of like your followers, your community, new investors in the Start Engine community, the Seed Invest and Start Engine community of investors. Um, of the three investor groups, what is the percentage break breakdown of each group for the total investment? Got it. It's it's a great question. So it's going to vary depending on whichever platform. You know, we have competitors out there, which we'll get into in a future slide, but. Um, it's typically the framework we like to set is a third, a third, a third. Um, now, in reality, certain platforms have more active communities than others. We track this data. I think this year, sort of week over week, it's around 50 to 60 percent coming from the start engine community as you look at you know the platform as a whole. Um, and the other 40 percent is typically a mix of your own community and the general public and new investors acquired through paid media. Um, so hopefully that helps for now. It's, it's very specific. You know, if a community, if a issuer goes live with a million dollar round and has a very active community and drives six or 70, 60 to 70% of the round, it might be skewed. We might come in, you know, more effectively towards the end. So, uh, it could be a mix and typically we can give you a good estimate just based on, you know, some of the metrics you provide us, email lists, followers, and we can try to give you a sense of based on your industry, what we typically see. Um, and just the next two slides are really just high level things for you guys to keep in your back pocket, you know, as you, you know, move past this webinar, um, you know, we're very well led. The CEO of Start Engine was the co-founder of Activision. Um, if, you're, if you guys are gamers or familiar with Call of Duty, that was his last venture that was sold to Microsoft. Um, and he's very involved in all of our operations. So, you know, we're very well led without Seed Invest. We've raised about 700 million for our companies with Seed Invest. It's north of 1.1 billion. Um, a million investors or users on the platform. Again, you know, inclusive of Seed Invest, it's a lot more. And if you've seen our homepage or any of our ads, you might be aware that Kevin O'Leary or Mr. Wonderful is one of our strategic advisors. Um, which we leverage, you know, on the paid partnership side of things as well. Um, a couple other things to pull out of this slide, you know, I think it's really important to understand the model is different than a Kickstarter and Indiegogo, where you'll have access to this capital essentially 21 days after you launch. So you don't need to hit certain milestones or benchmarks throughout the raise to start closing on funds and putting those funds back into the business to fuel growth. So typically what companies will do is they'll launch, you know, generate that early momentum and then disperse on funds, you know, bi-weekly or once a month so that they're constantly, you know, generating cash and putting it into the business versus waiting until you reach a million dollars to make that first disbursement. Um, we talk, I get a lot of questions. There's probably going to be some that come up later in this webinar just about what does my cap table look like? How am I supposed to manage, you know, these thousands of investors? 
Um, just important to note that we are a transfer agent. Um, Start Engine Secure, similar to a Carta or a Port Connects, if you're familiar with those platforms. Um, we manage these investors, and given our status as a carrying broker dealer, we have the ability to hold securities um, in nominee form or in custody in order for us to consolidate your cap table to just a single line item. Um, again, to think of these types of investors, retail investors, more as passive investors. A lot of issuers, you know, do non-voting securities or they vote by proxy. So really, it's a best practice to keep them up to date say monthly or quarterly with important business updates, but these aren't the type of investors to knock on your door trying to make decisions for the company. So it's, it's a very passive group. A um, couple of numbers here, I'd say these are really the three big platforms. I'd put Seed Invest in there as well, um, but some of the other competitors that really exist specifically around really the Reg CF stuff um, that we're doing. And we've led the industry you know, through 2021, 2022, and then made a really important acquisition to, to maintain that status moving forward. But with that, you know, I'd love to turn this over to Grady um, to just chat about, you know, I think it'd just be helpful for this crowd to hear what your experience has been, you know, what made you initially think about going the crowdfunding experience um, or the crowdfunding route? How was your experience? What types of things did you do throughout the raise to make you as successful as you were? Um, and then hopefully after this, you know, we'll open it up and have a dialogue with, with the audience as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, basically we started our uh, start engine round towards the very end of 2019, December 2019. Prior to that, we had spent probably a full year trying to go out and do a traditional raise. And we're a 10-year-old company, so not, not a startup. Um, but it was, you know, basically the traditional route, it was taking a lot of meetings, a lot of calls, brewery tours, lunches, drinks, all of that. Um, and we never got, you know, a legit term sheet signed. Um, you know, it, it felt like um, it, it was a huge waste of our time. It seemed like it was a waste of uh, the potential investors' time. Um, but we got to the point where we really needed cash and we needed it quickly. Um, and because we had explored this other route that wasn't working, we knew that we had to try something different. And uh, the procedure to get set up on Start Engine um, was extremely quick and we put a lot into it, obviously, but you know, it only took a couple months. And when we did kind of launch it, it does take a lot of uh, a lot of energy and and effort at the beginning, it's really important to kind of get the momentum going. Um, and so we were really active at the beginning of it. And because of the, the rolling close and the ability to kind of make disbursements, really shortly after, in, in I would say January, we were able to kind of uh, stabilize the, the business in a really successful way and get in the kind of capital and um, and cash that, that we needed. And then from that point on, we were able to kind of take it a little bit more slowly um, to finish out the round at the time when we did this, the, the max was 1.07 million, not the 5 million it is now. And we came, you know, just slightly under that, but um, yeah, I felt it was a really successful raise. Um, what Andre said about um, the brand ambassadors, that's probably the thing that I've noticed the most. We you know, picked up some 1,200 investors. The majority of those are at around like $800,000 check sizes. And we've seen, you know, um, the fact that they're brand ambassadors, that that shows up constantly. Um, and I really think that, especially for consumer product, you know, we're online, uh, that that has been a tremendous success. Uh, just having that many people that aren't just, you know, a lot of them were already buying your product, but now they're pushing your product and uh, really trying to introduce it to other people. They're also uh, extremely helpful. We've had you know, people that from various professions that have reached out that have said that uh, they invest in the company and offered their services or their help. Um, everyone's just trying to really support uh, the growth of your company. And so um, our, our feeling was it, was it was a great success. I don't think that it's something um, a lot of people you know, realize as an option for them and uh, that's why I'm taking place uh, with this webinar. Um, I really want to, to share our experience with it and encourage people to do it because it's an option that maybe not a lot of people are familiar with. 
What was it like, Grady, from like, um, there's so many steps, right? There's like, there's the design side, like as a founder, you've got to create content like you would anything else. Um, were you guys doing a lot of that stuff um, in-house? Did you go with like an outside agency that kind of helped you promote it and, and create the content and the graphics and the videos? Um, there's like, I'm sure the campaigning part where you have to use that content to like actually start raising funds. Like, what was that process like for you guys? Yeah, uh, we did it all in-house and we have a real slim team here. We de definitely uh, utilized uh, Start Engine's help and them kind of, you know, giving us somewhat of a template for what a, a campaign page would look like, what sort of perks you might want to offer. Uh, spoke to some other companies that had done it. Um, I think that we could have done uh, a better job, you know, if I could, uh, and this is on my company side, nothing to do with start engine. Um, but if I could do it over, I think that we could even make a, a more compelling case. Um, but yeah, no, it was like, you know, existing, we, we didn't spend a tremendous amount on new content. Um, we pretty much used existing photos, existing slides, existing videos. And that's one of the ways that I think we could have, uh, if I had to, to do it over, I think that I would probably make uh, some content that's specific to this raise, um, but, you know, we didn't and it was successful as well. So um, how important that is, I think, really does depend on, on what your community looks like already. Um, as I said, we've been around for, for 10 years, but we didn't have a massive, massive community, you know, maybe I think around 12,000 um, followers on Instagram at the time and maybe an email list of um, I don't know, maybe 15,000 people. And I would say the split for us was uh, definitely a majority were, uh, you know, people that were following our brand, buying our brand beforehand. Um, and so, you know, things like email blasts and, um, you know, putting on social media, that was really helpful for us. Uh, I don't think that, and we had also had, you know, so many people, if it's friends, family, or just strangers that have been reaching out for a long time asking uh, if they could invest and, and had the opportunity and we'd always kind of turn them down. And then this was the first time that we were like, all right, now it really is open. And um, I think a lot of people were really excited about the opportunity to invest in a brand that they really enjoyed already. That's awesome. Yeah. So it wasn't so much like something you need more time to do the actual raise. You're saying like you would need more time just to like prepare for the raise, create all the content you wanted to do, like and do it right, put some time to it. Um, and that yeah. and that cool. Yeah, I would say, which I think this uh either speaks to the 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 strength of, of start engine or uh, to some degree our, our brand. I, you know, to be perfectly honest, we did not put as much time as as we should have into it and it was still successful. Um, so yeah, no, I just think that um, that, that I could have done a, a better campaign page uh, and I think it could have, the raise could have gone even even quicker or if we had, um, you know, done it again and 5 million was uh, the cap. I think that uh, there are things that, that we could have done to be more successful. I'm also, despite being on this webinar I'm, uh, and having my, my name on the product, I'm actually, uh, really shy. And so, you know, everyone had always uh, encouraged us or start engine encourage us to do webinars to, you know, potential investors. And that's something that I never did. But um, I had heard from other people on the platform that said that that was extremely successful. And I believe it. Um, I think that that's something that that if I was to do it again, that um, I think would would make a lot of sense. So it's stuff like that that I think that our campaign could have improved on, but um, you know, it worked. And I remember like seeing you when you were live on Start Engine, and I was like literally about to put in some offers for some shares, and I probably got distracted from some email that came in, and then I forgot to go back and I missed the entire race. So I kind of like regret um, that I didn't take part in it, but, but I was really excited to see your brand on there. I, I've known you for, I've never met you in person probably because both of us are pretty shy, but, um, certainly interacted with, with, with Radies when you guys first launched in the early days and, and happy to hear that you had a successful run with, with, um, with, with Start Engine. I, I have another question for you, um, Grady, and it might be a question for Anders as well. Did you have to like, when you were doing the raise, I mean, Grady, you, you started a company, um, you know, a pretty 
recognizable brand. I don't know if it's nationally recognizable. There's a lot of brands on this call that might know. Certainly very, very recognizable in the New York market, in the New York City market. I still remember the garage door that was painted with Grady's in Williamsburg and Brooklyn, um, like almost a staple of the community for a long time. I don't think it's there anymore, um, but for other reasons, I'm sure. But um, I can, you know, real estate development and such. But um, did you have to, you know, you start a company, we started Farm to Me as a startup, you started Great Easy as a startup. Um, you probably structured it as some kind of like a corporation or LLC or whatever it was you decided to do in New York or, or Delaware. Did you have to restructure it at all when you were doing your raise? Did you have to like go in and hire lawyers and and, and restructure the the corporation or the, the LLC in that process? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, we founded the company. We were an LLC um, in New York and uh, because we were going to do the, the start engine raise and, and we wanted um, the ability to have the entire kind of start engine um, investor to be one line item on, on the cap table. Um, that was one of the reasons why we restructured and, and we went to uh, C Corp, also based out of New York. Um, and, you know, it wasn't tremendously expensive. We did um, have an attorney um, do that restructuring for us, but um, it was not, you know, a, a mega process. We, we also ended up changing um, the name of it. And so, you know, more than anything, it's just um, all the work of uh, reaching out to all the, the people that you do business with, that they have the, the correct name and, and stuff like that. And so it's just kind of paperwork is, is the pain, but uh, it wasn't too expensive. Cool. So many questions coming in. Yeah, sorry. I want to just jump in on that topic. I was on mute. We get asked a lot. There's questions around this as well. Um, it's important to note that legally, you know, the way that the reg regulations work, you can raise as an LLC, you know, go out and issue units or as a C-Corp and go out and issue shares. There's nothing stopping you. doesn't make a difference to start engine either. We've got LLCs on the platform that are raising. Um, the biggest thing to take into account, though, is K-1s. Because as an LLC, you have to file these investor reports every year, known as the K-1 to all your investors. Um, and if you're out there raising $5 million from 5,000 people, it just becomes very administrative. You know, nobody works for free. So if you hire somebody to do K-1s, it can get expensive. Um, so that's usually the, the mindset on why companies will look into doing a conversion, depending on if there are any you know, major tax implications of doing that switch. Um, but there are other structures that I could walk you through offline that are, you know, similar to a corp, but have the advantages of an LLC. So there's other ways around the K-1s. A um, couple other just quick logistical questions to knock out. So the, I should have mentioned this earlier, but Reg CF and uh, Reg A are open to international investments outside of obviously countries that are listed on the OFAC list. We cannot accept investments from Canada and the UK, but the companies that we're supporting need to be US based. Um, Reg A, you can be based in Canada. Um, so it's Canada, US, Reg CF specifically for the US based companies. Um, there are crowdfunding platforms that exist in Europe or in the UK, for example. It's just the differences in security laws and regulations don't mesh well with the SEC. So that's why we can't accept UK investments or Canadian investments and why we only stick to the US-based companies um, under the SEC purview. Another question somebody had, um, Anders, was, um, and, and I'm great, you could talk to this as well, because we have you and, you know, it's hypothetical probably from Anders' perspective and very real from your perspective. Like, how long does it usually take for a brand, you know, from the start, like from the application process to actually raising a fund? Like, how long does that actually, how long, how much time does that usually take? Yeah, I think that we were uh, we were quoted that you know as long as we put in the the time and the commitment and kind of answered all the the things that Start Engine was um, you know asking for that it would take two months and that's exactly what it took um, and that's that's really important because again we we were in need of the the capital and um, and it delivered in that in that time frame so you know again don't going over a year. In a traditional way, and not receiving any capital to two months, and able to make a disbursement, and so uh, it really was quick. Um, 
it was not, you know, we were running the business that, that whole time. So it's not like we uh, dropped everything to do it. So I wouldn't say that um, the time commitment was, you know, really anything crazy. A lot of this stuff you already have, uh, especially if you've been, you know, you've already made raised decks or whatever. You're just kind of repurposing and tweaking the stuff for this platform. But um, yeah, just right around two months. Yep, and just for logistical start engine input, I'd say two months is a very good estimate on how long it can take. Our goal is usually six to eight weeks. If there's an LLC that needs to convert to a C-Corp, might be eight to 10 weeks. So right around that time is, is good. We do set campaigns open for about 90 days, um, typically with goals to reach the first million in a 90-day period. There's always opportunities to extend it or shorten it as need be. Um, but all in, you know, it's, it's a, it can be a relatively quick process. Um, I see a couple of questions in here. You know, how does a brand know when they're ready for a CF? Um, work with me and my team. You know, we're very transparent. We just need to know a little bit more about the company. Um, I mean, revenue is a small piece of, of what we're looking at when we're, you know, identifying or analyzing investment opportunities. I'd say having a strong community of support is going to supersede the importance of revenue. We've done plenty of pre-revenue raises, um, you know, corporate structuring, things like that, you know, are, are helpful to have in place. Um, we do support, you know, real estate companies. I would say this, this webinar specifically is focused a lot on consumer goods. It's typically a natural fit. You know, if you have a laundry list of, or a long list of, you know, customers on your email list, it's a really good starting point when you want to launch, you know, an equity crowdfunding offering, but we support everything. You know, we do B2B, SaaS, clean tech, electric cars, um, med tech, biopharma, real estate. There's, you know, the opportunities are endless. Um, so if you're outside of the consumer goods space, by all means, I recommend that you go to startengine.com and just check out some of the offerings that we have listed. Um, it's, we're pretty agnostic to industry. I would say. There's another question that somebody asked that was answered, but um, we may as well just bring to the front as we get on this list is, um, I know you mentioned Canadian companies can qualify for Reg CF. Um, there's another one, a question about, um, can investors be international? Meaning do investors need to be limited to USA or can international investors invest? In something well, like yeah, that. that was um that's what i was getting at earlier as long as you're not from canada or the uk or the countries listed on the ofac list um we can accept investments from internationals um but the entity itself must be the u.s based um ceo executive team in the u.s um things like that and i see a, an interesting question here about recently raising capital from a few angels and uh, family offices that needs sort of a platform and a community to fill out the offering. Um, we see that a lot. So we see companies that are out, you know, in today's market looking for 5 million, they've got two and they need alternative or means to fill out the remaining three. Um, in those situations, you know, we typically look at the terms of the offering. If we're good with the terms, we'd match the terms and open up the round to um, non-accredited investors too. So a really good example of this is I'm out there raising a reg D the minimum investment is a hundred thousand dollars and I've sort of hit a wall. Um, but I have a lot of family and friends and other people in my network that would like to invest, but they're non-accredited or they only have a couple thousand dollars to invest or they don't fit the minimums for the reg D well, that might be a good opportunity to open the door by opening a reg CF offering to be more inclusive of everybody you know, that has expressed interest so that you're not leaving money on the table. Cool. What's like the, what's the minimum? I mean, like, what are the parameters? Like we talked about um, the percentage breakdown of groups, but like realistically, if you're, if you're, if you're coming to the platform, um, you know, Grady's, you've done a bunch of raises. So this is also probably a good question for you, but like, Anders, what, how much money do you have to be bringing in? Like, what is, what should the value of your company be? If we could talk a little bit about that, like how much revenue are you bring in or how much revenue should you be bringing in? And then also like as a second question, um, to be realistically attractive, I guess, right? And then and the second question is like, how does that value your company? Like what what does like 
a three hundred thousand dollar you know in revenue look like in terms of an eval evaluation or 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 a million dollars of revenue? What does that look like in valuation? Yep. So the valuation is a really good conversation. Um, now it's important to note that Start Engine does not set valuations for the companies that are listed on our platform. Um, from a compliance perspective, we're required to do some due diligence on that valuation, which means that we ask the founders and the executive team for a reasonable basis on how you got to that number. There's a number of different ways that you can come to valuations. You know, we don't require a 409A, but there are, you know, companies that go out to, you know, a third party firm to, to help them with the valuation. There is, you know, looking at your industry and revenue numbers, there's certain multiples that you can use. A lot of companies will use comparables as long as the comparable is, you know, the same year, let's say, you know, using a comparable for 2021 right now to set a 2023 valuation is, you know, holds less weight. Um, but there are certain different ways, discounted cash flows, different sort of strategies you can use to get to valuation. Um, being early stage, you know, it's some say it's more of an art than a science, um, but we do want to understand the numbers and the reasoning to back the valuations that you want to go go out and raise at. Um, I'd say for minimum investments, I can speak directly towards, you know, what we see, you know, obviously after many, many years of doing this, we have a lot of data. Um, we comp Some companies, depending on their community, would go as low as, you know, $100 or $250 as like the minimum check size for the Reg CF offering. You know, our data shows us that a, a minimum investment of around $400 is usually the sweet spot. Um, 500 plus when you get into Reg A and the average investment is typically around three to four X what you set the minimum at. So if you're a, a brand or a company out there that wants to really build the community um, and engage to get a, just a lot, a lot of people on the cap table for some of the, you know, the ambassador side of things, you may want to go as low as $100. Um, but outside of that initiative, typically 250 to 400 is, is a good range. And, and Grady, I know, I mean, you and I have been around for a long time. I mean, we, we've been in the small emerging food and bev space for a while. I think you launched in either 2010 or 2011 or something like that. Um, that's how far we go back. Um, do you remember what size you were at that time when you were doing your start engine raise? How much revenue? Uh, yeah, no, we were uh, revenue wise. I want to say we were around seven, seven million in revenue. Uh, we were not profitable at the time. Uh, we are now, and that was what this raise was due. We knew we were we were close to kind of getting over the the hump, and and we were successful at that. And we have not um, had to raise money since then. And um, I know I understand, like discussed it, like there are people that wanted to participate in this, this raise um, that weren't able to, and we're kind of keeping those, those names, but um, yeah, we have, we have not had to from that point. And um, it's thanks to, thanks to this raise that we were able to kind of get that last bit of capital that we needed um, to, to get over that hump. And it's been, it's been good since then. Yeah, but we see we see it all, all different stages, different types of revenues, different operating losses. Um, again, the financials are one piece of what makes it an, an offering exciting and compelling to join. Now, what I, I know just to be cautious of time here, I want to just leave everybody with sort of like my take on what it takes to be successful in this space. Um, obviously, I've been doing this for a couple of years and I've seen companies go out and do five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, and I've seen other ones do you know, a couple thousand and just, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't worth it in the end. It wasn't as good as it seems. So I would say over my experience, I've seen that like there's three pillars of success. Um, I think it's really important that issuers have a CEO and have a founder that's, you know, willing and able to put themselves out there. You know, they're an industry expert when they make claims about the market and the company, you know, they're credible um, and being able to, you know, go out and, you know, put in the hours to talk to their community and talk to investors. Um, again, it goes back to that get out what you put in. And we look a lot at the executive team and the founders and try to build relationships with them to understand if they can deliver on a raise um, and if this is the right model for them. The other piece is just to have an audience, you know, to have a community really difficult for, you know, a stealth company to go out and do this if there's hesitations around the publicity aspect of this or there's, 
you know, no IP in place and there's a fear of this getting picked up by, you know, PR or media, those types of companies don't typically go the equity crowdfunding route. And the, the third piece or the third pillar would really just to be to have an exciting and a compelling offering. Um, a lot of that comes down to price valuation, you know, with equity crowdfunding, like a Kickstarter, you can build in perks and incentives to give your customers or your community some other form of monetary value. Maybe it's a discount on product, maybe it's free product. There's other ways to gamify this a bit. Um, and at the end of the day, when you look at, you know, the third, a third, a third, the different buckets of, you know, investors that come in and contribute to this offering, keep in mind that your community is a part of that. And if you want to offer them a discount on the valuation or provide them with more shares based on the size of their investment, there's definitely opportunities to do that. So, you know, when you go through the site and you check out, you know, some of the campaigns that we're supporting, I, I, I urge you to look at the terms and, you know, you as a you know founder, is this an exciting offering or what can I do to make this compelling and make it a no brainer for our supporters to come in? Um, and that's really what we what me and my team do is we help, you know, better understand those three pillars and help set you up for a successful offering um, by helping you structure and give you things to think about or put into place before going live. Three last questions. I know I want to dedicate some time to talk about like what the cost is of, uh, you know, of, of marketing, things like that. One is, um, can you raise for equity? Sorry, can you raise for debt? Meaning instead of giving up equity, can you just do a, a debt raise or debt round? Yeah, so we do support convertible notes. Um, we've got some companies that are out there issuing notes. So market cap, discount rate, you know, that's a, that's a form of debt. The ma overwhelming majority of companies on Start Engine, at least, are doing priced rounds. Um, but the type of security is really just part of the terms of the offering that we'll work on. Um, oftentimes, these days, we're doing safes as well. You know, if you're not sure where you fall for valuation and want to punt that conversation down the line a little bit, we can issue out a safe or a Start Engine safe. Um, but that would be, we don't typically do much of you know, rev shares or anything like that. It's mostly priced around with the exceptions for convertible notes and safes. And then if you raise, let's say you are doing it for equity, um, do you, Ingrid, did you do this? Like, do you have to create like a new class of shares? Like, I know for those of us that are, that are corporate corporations and know about corporations, you can have a preferred share that gives you voting rights. You can have a common share that doesn't give you voting rights. Both of those shares can give you equity. Um, does, does there is there like a new a new class of shares? Are they common shares? Are they preferred shares? Do you have to give voting rights? Um, what's kind of like the typical? Um, can you answer that, Anders? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the type of security is really up to you guys. Um, now, a couple of things to note. I mean, these types of investors, you know, they don't demand voting rights, um, so you can usually get away with like a non-voting class of common. That's usually pretty you know common. Um, but what I would say is there's some companies do create a new class. Maybe they have class A common that has voting rights and they want to create a class B common that doesn't have voting rights. So they'll create that class and then issue that class as part of the raise. Other companies will issue the class A voting stock through Start Engine, but sell the securities with a proxy that forfeits those voting rights to the CEO, which makes them non-voting by nature. Um, other companies will issue preferred. So a lot of what we've seen is, let's say you're... Um, I don't know, a, a VC backed company with $15 million raised and preferred um, to come on to start engine and go out and issue common stock is not necessarily going to be the best investment opportunity, just given, you know, the liquidation ladder. So in that case, you may want to, you know, issue out preferred shares again, um, just to make the investment opportunity going back to one of those pillars of success, you know, exciting, compelling versus coming underneath, you know, a huge stack of preferred on the cap table. So it's usually case by case on how you structure this. Some companies create new classes, but there's also the power of that proxy where you can use existing classes of shares and just tweak them a little bit um, to maintain control. And I'm assuming like if you, I don't know, are a holding company, you're somebody who owns several brands. I know Grady's, you're not in that boat. I don't think you guys don't have multiple lines, right? It's all. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. If you have multiple lines, like I don't know, you, you you're, I don't know, big brand. I'm thinking like like uh, 
eco trust or something one of those chocolate brands and now has like rice lines and uh, can you have those kind of brands been successful on the platform as well where you're like a holding company and you're not like a physical I mean, you're a physical good but you're really representing multiple brands definitely yeah we can do both um again we want to look at what is the actual offering if i'm an investor and i you know purchase securities what am i getting so you know a good it's an, a good argument is that investing in the holding company is the better investment opportunity because you're able to you know see the benefits or reap the benefits of the success of any of the individual brands it's a safer bet um, or you can just go out and raise for a single brand or a single entity. It just limits the amount that you can talk about compliantly about the holding company and what else is going on underneath that umbrella. So it just alters you know, what you can talk about, what you can say, what you can't say. But overall, it comes down to what is the investor getting? So do you want to issue securities of you know, a one single brand and use 100% of the proceeds to go out and branch that brand? Or do you want to raise at the hold co level, issue securities into the hold co and divvy out the use of proceeds? Maybe the proceeds go 30% to one brand, 50% to another, 20% to the third. It just gives you a little bit more flexibility to raise at the hold co level on where you deploy the funds um, and what you can talk about in regards to the campaign and what you're raising for. And then if you, let's say, we do run a successful campaign, you, you raise one point you know, whatever it was, million that Grady raised. Um, and then like future down the line, five years later, you want to go to a VC, you want to raise capital. Is that going to impact the cap table? Like it really, again, a lot of this comes down to the structure of the offering. I sound like a broken record player, but I would say that back in 2016, 2017, when equity crowdfunding was, you know, in its infancies, this concern came up a lot. What are the VCs going to think? Does this look desperate that I'm going out to crowdfund? I'd say that that dynamic has changed a lot. Um, I think the right VC will see the value in investing into Grady's because of the thousand super fans that they have now that are going out and amplifying the business. Um, if you go out and issue non-voting common shares, I'll guarantee you that the VC is going to want preferred. They're not going to come in at the same class, so they're higher up in preference. So they don't necessarily care who's below them on the cap table. They're going to want voting rights, board seats. It's a different type of investment. But I would say overall, you know, we have VCs that participate in these campaigns that we list. Um, we have VCs that use the platform as a deal source, if you will, to go and look at, look, this company raised $5 million from the general public. Clearly, they're on to something and people care about this business because they're investing and then they connect offline to pursue future rounds. So. Um, that's how I'd say. Cool. So I think I'll kick the last couple of minutes to you. I know people are probably going to dip at like 55 after just to get ready for their one o'clock calls. Um, pricing, how does it all work? Like how much does it cost to do the marketing? Um, how much does it cost to actually run a campaign? How much you have to put up front? Um, you know, and so on and so forth. Yep. So I'll I'll speak just specifically to Start Engine, not entirely sure how other platforms operate, but we are success based, which means that we take our fees on the back end. So start engine on any given raise doesn't make a dollar until you launch the campaign, go out and raise capital and make those disbursements. And our fees come on the disbursement. So the way that we're structured is there's a cash component and an equity component. So based on the amount raised, we take a certain piece in, in cash and then we're issued, I think it's 3% of the total amount raised in the form of securities. So we would be issued via Reg D 3% of the total, not 3% of the company in securities. Um, now, there are some upfront costs, however, to be just cognizant of. Basically, if you're a C-Corp, you need those two years of CPA reviewed financials that get paid to the CPA. It doesn't you know, get paid to start engine, but they are required to launch. Um, in basic, you know, whatever fees we can defer and absorb, we do, and we defer to the back end. Um, but the upfront cost, if you want to go out and build a video for the page, for example, you may need to go and invest in you know, new content. Um, but the, the marketing piece is really important because there is an element to equity crowdfunding. If you want to be successful and you want to be successful quickly, that you want to be actively marketing and advertising the campaign. So most companies will use capital from the raise. They'll recycle funds that have been invested into the paid media campaigns throughout the campaign. But the most important thing to think about here, which is sort of a trick of the trade, if you will, 
Um, for anyone that's stuck around for the full hour, you're welcome. But the all of the funds that you spend on marketing and advertising and promoting this offering, from an accounting perspective, those costs can be capitalized, which means you can put them on your balance sheet as cost of capital acquisition and not a marketing expense on your P&L. Now, that's very important when you're setting your, the, your own terms for the offering, because you can set your valuation to reflect, okay, based on Start Engine's guidance and success stories, we might spend 10% of this million dollars on marketing and advertising. Well, then instead of raising out a $10 million pre-money, maybe you want to raise that an $11 million pre-money or 10% higher so that you're not diluting yourself by using a portion of the proceeds on marketing and advertising and investor acquisition. So, you know, brands that go out and do crazy PR and spend a lot on paid media, you know, at the end of the day, if they've set the valuation appropriately and they're ca capitalizing these costs, you're still going to see the boost in sales, more brand engagement, increase of followers. You're going to get all those secondary marketing benefits from like a, a normal PR campaign. But from an accounting perspective, you can put them as cost of capital acquisition on your balance sheet instead of P&L. And for the most part, from my understanding, really all of these channels, Facebook, Google, that type of marketing activity can be capitalized. I think it's a little different with TV. I think when we run TV ads, we don't capitalize those costs, but it's just more of a regulatory definition of, of advertising and marketing. But again, we're very involved when it comes to you know structuring these offerings and we'll basically coach you through in your specific situation and industry and community, how much we think you might be spending on marketing and advertising to hit your given target. And then we'll make the adjustments accordingly um, to help you structure this the right way. Awesome. Any other questions from anyone in the audience? Thanks for doing this, Anders. Uh, and great. Thanks for being here, man. Um, obviously, the founders are really busy as everyone knows it's on this call. so. I really appreciate you being here, Grady, and, and it's a pleasure to finally meet you 12 years later. No, absolutely. Happy to do it. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Anders. Appreciate it. Any yep. questions at all from anyone in the crowd? Any last questions? Expand more about capitalizing the marketing expense to reg CF. Of course, Brooke. Yeah, I would say not much I can really get into more in the weeds on that. It's just, it's a item on your balance sheet, cost of capital acquisition. Um, and just given that you're, the nature of these ads is to go out and acquire investors. It's not to sell products. So that differentiation is about how you can justify the, the balance sheet versus your P&L. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great, great topic. If you're interested in this, talk to your CPA about that. Um, they'll, be in good hands. Hey guys, I'm going to jump in really quickly because we're just about at the hour and I want to make sure we uh, we end on time for everybody, uh, for Grady, for Gary and Andrews who uh, joined today. Uh, thank you all for coming out. We'll definitely send the follow-up of the slides and presentation. And I did want to quickly make a shout out. I know there's a lot of founders, uh, startup folks in the crowd. And this is a separate announcement, but we also have a pretty amazing scout program. And by the way, I'm Inaki. I'm the head of partnerships at Start Engine. Uh, there's a scouts program. It's how we come across and meet companies like Grady's and hundreds of others. It's really um, individuals that know about equity crowdfunding and they refer companies out to us. They introduce us to other people just like Grady that have great companies. So it's the Start Engine Scout program. I'll link it in the chat so you can access it. If you refer a company to us, uh, we actually pay you guys out capital, cash. Uh, so you can check it out there. We pay $4,000 to anybody that refers a company that signs with us. The important part here is that's how we actually meet companies like Grady's. It's impossible for Start Engine to be in every city all at once, in every nook and cranny, in every accelerator. So we really rely on our community of scouts to introduce us to the next awesome, impressive company out there. So if this is of interest, click on that link, check it out. It's really uh, self-explanatory and you can reach out to the scout team and we'll tell you more. Um, last thing I'll mention is we have paid out over $750,000 in cash to scouts since we started this program. So take advantage and uh, thank you again, uh, Grady, Gary, Andrews for uh, taking us through this uh, great uh, presentation. 
And Anaki, do you know, I know Daniel probably knows the answer to this question. We we did negotiate a discount, a farm to me discount to anyone that comes from the farm to me network. Um, do you want to just touch on that real quick, Daniel, for the participants that are still here? We'll, yep. we'll email our, our teams as well, but just in case. Yep. So um we had discussed and you know, want to all to me community a three thousand dollar discount off of their uh you know flat fee that anders kind of touched upon earlier so we don't offer this to most communities uh you know farm to me is obviously a great community we like gary and uh you know we love grady too so want to be able to help out more founders uh you know in this space and make it happen so yeah just mention that you come from farm to me when you reach out to anders and uh, we'll make that happen thank all right everybody have a great day thank right. you thank you everyone Thanks, guys. Thanks for putting this together.